started now. Um, I am not currently on camera. I'm sorry that I am speaking from off the camera for those who are joining us both via Zoom and YouTube uh, uh, um, live stream um, because of stupid technical issues with my computer. Um, so I will have to get up here to introduce people, um, but the other but the presentations themselves and the comment will be um, from the table up there, and also one uh, coming on via the uh, via the Zoom. Two quick housekeeping notes: If you have to leave before the end of the event, please leave via the back door there, so that it doesn't um, uh, it doesn't uh, interrupt. Um, and also, just to let you know, there will be um, three presentations um, followed by. Uh, followed by uh, a comment that will really be in the form of asking a few questions. The presentations themselves are pretty short. The idea is to open this up to discussion for those people online and here in person. Um, so that's, that's how things will go. I'm Belinda Davis. I'm the acting director of the Center for European Studies, and I'm really thrilled to welcome everyone to today's events, thrilled on several counts. Today, the Rutgers Center for European Studies offers a civil society debate of the EU-funded Values Grant, that's V-E-L, capital E-U-S, which is sponsoring this event and via the 20-member Global Grant Consortium, bringing together an audience from around the world, as well as right here at home in New Brunswick, New Jersey, USA, the ancestral territory of the indigenous Lenape people. For the grant sponsorship, I thank our own Professor Sadia Abbas, as well as Professors Klaskovos, Ulrika Taptikon, Jakub Jakubowski, Nico Halman, and Tim Beifeld, and others who've so contributed to making this event happen. Here at Rutgers, I would also like to thank the School of Arts and Sciences, Rutgers Global, and Rutgers Climate and Energy Institute, um, as well as incoming CES director, Regina Carl, and especially Martine Adams and Pete Zatelli for their tireless efforts. These civil society debates are intended to offer important opportunities to bring together activists, academics, and activist academics to discuss issues critical to the EU and globally. And certainly there is nothing more critical to discuss now than climate change and how we can move forward in making changes with the essential urgency required. And this is possible, even as flooding besets Central Europe, the southeastern United States, and Nepal, for example, just today, the country that started coal-powered energy, closely linked from the beginning with colonizing practices and those that destroyed climate, habitat, food and water and supply, and so on, the UK, that is, has phased out its last coal-fired plant. If Austria has just given an electoral victory to the radical nationalist Freedom Party, locking doors to migrants, including climate refugees, at least we can observe that the party's leadership has, in the last five years, recognized human activity as central in global warming. These determinations did not come from sudden epiphanies by the political leaders of those countries. They came from activism, informed grassroots activism that has effectively spread the message and pressured politicians to act, if not yet enough. These victories are important to emphasize, for an understandable tendency is for us all to feel paralyzed by the enormity of the crisis. Instead, we must act as if our lives depend on it, because they do. And that is why I'm also so thrilled and honored to introduce to you Louisa Marin Neubauer. Louisa Neubauer may be best known globally for her role in co-founding the youth climate campaign, Fridays for Future, and thus for many, and I think probably especially in the US, for her association with Greta Thunberg. Thunberg is, of course, a critical figure and figurehead. She's taken world leaders to task in no uncertain terms, for example, at the United Nations. But she is one person 
and can do only so much on her own, though media outlets often treat the issue otherwise. What Luisa Neubauer represents above all so powerfully is awareness that it is not enough to speak as one person. Her own greatest impacts have included bringing together millions of others along with her in protest, in offering solutions, and in pressuring for the change we need. It is notable that of the several books she's authored, each has been co-written with others. Here are two of my own, um, well, well read at this point. Other youth, for example, in the beginning of the end of the beginning of the end of climate change, very readable by the way, very practical, translated into English by Sabina von Merling, who also helped bring Louisa to us today, and also with older people, those of us far more responsible for the ongoing climate crisis, as here with Bernd Olich, in a book that translates as We Still Have the Choice, a discussion of freedom, ecology, and the generational conflict, also very readable for anyone who wants to practice their German. These books and her talks around the world have given millions hope if we take action. And it was in the, this form that she and others forced the University of Göttingen in Germany, for example, to stop investing in industries that make money with coal, oil, and gas. She's also skilled in helping us see how connected the climate crisis is with the closely linked with virtually all other current crises including, for example, inflation and other economic swings that seem to de demand our attention from one day to the next. So Louisa Neubauer is here today to discuss and inspire, but just to say it again, that inspiration does nothing if we do not move on what we, uh, um, to act on what we know, to use our rage at the future at the, at the currently grim future for ourselves and for those coming after us to push for change and to keep pushing because there will never be one a one and done solution. So please join me in welcoming Louisa Neubauer. Thank you. Yeah, is it on? Is it? Ah, hi. Thank you so much. That's a really uh, very kind introduction. Um, I wish my mom could have heard that. Um, yes, I'm Louisa. Um, I am technically a master student of geography in Germany and practically uh, mostly working as a climate activist and climate advocate. And I'm organizing protests like the one you can see here, which was our one of our recent mass mobilizations just before the European elections. Um, yes, and the, the, I mean, we will cover quite a bit of, of, of different issues today. And I think we will have, I'm really looking forward to our discussion and to everything, maybe just to um, kind of explain a little about my, uh, of, of my, my current work. I have spent the last six years organizing um, climate mobilization, trying to get the German and European governments to uh, act in time and to listen to the science. And I found, however, that in recent years, there has a new front line, a new front line emerged on the intersection of uh, right extremism, climate denial, fossil fuel lobbyism and climate extremes and that new these new climate frontiers you could call them make it very very hard and increasingly difficult to protest just to exemplify we had a recent global climate mobilization in many countries in the world and yet in more than 10 countries those mobilizations had to be cancelled because of fires or floods or droughts um really you know showcasing how we don't even have the time anymore to fight against the climate crisis because it's just so fast. And on the other side, we're seeing increasing climate denial really spreading to most of the political discourse. It's quite visible, obviously, in the US, but even in Germany. And so I'm spending two months right now at the US East Coast trying to find out how civil society students, any organization, personas, anyone, is trying to navigate in this tension because I do, I do hope that if solutions are livable, if solutions and answers to that new kind of emergence of poly crisis, as they say, 
if people figure out good answers to that, how to navigate, how to defend justice, um, peace and, uh, and climate action, if people find answers to that here, I would assume that these answers are quite sustainable and they might survive in many others, other environments too, just because this is such an extreme moment in time in the US and the world is looking, watching very closely and kind of dependent on strong and um, hopeful answers to that. So that is why I'm here and that is why for me it's so uh, such an honor to be here to, to get uh, to speak to you and uh, on Zoom, but also to learn from you guys uh, what this time does to you and what you think is needed and what is helping and what isn't helping. And I thought I just um, I share some of my um, kind of my learnings from the past um, years on, on climate justice and on climate activism. But before we do that, I think we would quickly jump into the science. Could we, could I get a next slide here? I think you have to kind of, ah, yeah, ah, yeah, that's me. That's the, um, one of the books. Um, uh, when I bring slides, I, I like to mention that I do not do graphic design, so please be kind. Um, yeah, and um, we're gonna start with a different book, though. If you um, if you go one slide further, yes, exactly, wonderful. This is my recent book. It is in German, but you will. Um, it's 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 about the graphics, so we will get through this. Bear with me. It's an atlas that I just published because I do find that. It is so easy to talk about climate without actually talking about the cl about climate. So um, what we see here, okay, we get through it, no worries. It looks complicated, more complicated than it is. What we're seeing is maybe one of the most um, amazing, or in my understanding, at least some of the most amazing, a, a gift from the past. It's a piece of data that we were gifted by Japan. So Japanese, um, gardeners have for the last thousand years noted down the days when the cherries in Kyoto in Japan are blooming. So they've noted the day of the cherry blossom in Japan for a thousand years. They didn't do it wanting to collect climate data, but we now found out this is some of the most valid and I would say astonishing climate that, that we have, as, like in particular because it wasn't supposed to be climate data. So what we see on the bottom is the f past um, 1000 years roughly. And on the side, we see the days of the year. So when there's little, little flower kind of rather at the bottom, this would mean it's quite a warm year because it's a warm spring. You would have an early cherry blossom maybe in, 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 in March. And if it's a bit of a colder year, you would get these spikes that you see at the top because it would take longer for the cherries to bloom. You know, you, you get it, right? And what we're seeing here, and I really want to make this point, we see the climate has been changing, right? So they noted down the days of the cherry blossom and you would see for the past thousand years, we did, we did see some variation here and we saw there is almost a rhythm to it. It was, it was uh, warmer and colder. And we now know if we match it with other available data, we know that the climate has been changing before. There was volcano um, action, for instance, volcano activity. There was some solar, solar situations and so on, causing kind of warmer and colder areas, uh, times. And what we also know, if we match that very climate data, which is now kind of specific for Japan, but it kind of maps especially uh, a tendency in the in the um, northern hemisphere once we match that very data this climate variation that we see with political conflict around the world with some you know historic developments we would see that there is a big parallel between the cooling and the warming of the climate in the past around you know here illustrated through the cherries. Um, there is a big parallel from that to say, um, peace and conflict in, in Europe. We see in the colder times, there used to be more hunger. It's often that time in these colder times when war broke out, when, when illnesses kind of started spreading. We saw that the Roman Empire collapsed around a time that it was quite cold around the Mediterranean Sea, causing hunger, causing conflict, causing migration, destabilizing the whole system. We see that these um, colder peaks, the last two colder peaks, so were around a time what we now call the little ice age so quite a cold period in, in Europe in particular where um, immense immense civilization changes happened 
they do not only happen because of weather or climate changes, just to be clear, but we do see that the climate has been changing in the past and we do see it has forever been affecting civilizations, sometimes to an incredibly severe degree. We rarely talk about these things. We don't, we, people learn probably about Hannibal crossing the Alps with the elephants. What people don't mention is that Hannibal could only take these 37 war elephants across the Alps because it was a warmer time in, in, in that period and the Alps were free from glaciers in the summer. So he could actually walk across these Alps. So there was not just a, a war, whatever, um, person trying to kind of make that journey. There was a climate circumstance to that that is often neglected when we talk about those historic, historic events, which I as a geographer find incredibly interesting how we kind of almost invisibilize how the climate has been affecting us forever. So now what I hear a lot, it's also something I like to hear in the US. It's a, it's a, it's a very popular rhetoric. They say, well, the climate has always been changing. Why would you freak out now? And that is when we come to the past 100 years that you don't see in this little graphic, if we could go one, one further. Yes. And you see where we've gotten. And I think that is something, if you take anything from my part uh, this afternoon, please take this along. Yes, the climate has always been changing, but we've left the zone that we use, uh, that we know of. We've had experiences with these you know, climate variations and they have caused severe harms for modern civilization. What we've entered now is a arena where there is no track record, no blueprint. There is nothing that can guide us here because we've and we've exited this this planetary safe space in which we used to navigate and put ourselves into the stupid experiment of um of a new of a new world that is increasingly um unsuitable for humans. Yeah, this has really inspired my work. This has got me to this kind of these data, these science um uh, the sciences have really got me to to kind of question what we're doing. And I was sitting in class studying geography, learning all these things off by heart. And at some point I found it almost disrespectful to us young people that we would have to learn all these things about the planet breaking down, but people wouldn't tell us what to do about that other than recycling, which I felt was a lovely and yet slightly insufficient answer to a planetary breakdown. And um, that is how I started. Can we go? Can we go one um, further? Yes, that is when I started the, um, with many others, the German climate movement. And we ask ourselves how to decarbonize democracies, economies, and society. So easy questions of today. And what it's, um, and there are many answers to that. There are many concepts to it. We have the models, we have the calculations of the science telling us we get we need to get away from fossil fuels. We need to, you know, rethink our financial, our trading, our whatever actually kind of all systems and yet we found there are some things that we tend to oversee when we talk about decarbonizing our democracies our economies and our societies could i could i can we get more um it is that this is not just here's another kind of beautiful way of showing that we are in a bit of a situation here um when we talk about climate and that is maybe my second point i would like to make today when we talk about climate we kind of don't talk about climate alone can we go further we talk about can we, ah perfect we talk about basically everything else what i mean is we have the science right and we had that science available to us for more than half a half a um, century and we have the greatest minds in the world telling us we need to act quickly. We have the United Nations telling us we need to get out of fossil fuels. We have the treaties. We have all these things. And yet you might wonder why aren't we getting where we need to get fast enough, if that might be the most rational choice. Not just, I would say, morally, but also if you want to make that case economically. It's just stupid to wreck um, everything that we depend on. It's the worst ever business case you could think of. And yet we're not doing it. And that, um, and one reason behind is that when we talk about climate in places like the US and places like Europe, we find increasingly we talk about something completely different. We talk, don't talk about science, we talk about culture. This is a billboard that is just right, right outside Boston. And when I arrived in the US, it's my first time here, this was one of the first things I saw. And I found it remarkable 
because this billboard alone is so telling about today's world and the very culture that we have established around fossil fuels. My activism isn't focused on getting people away from cars. It's, you know, I work on ending fossil fuels and providing people with, you know, circum infrastructure so they can swap. But it very much symbolizes that as long as between, say, some of the most divided groups of a country, a car is the one thing we can agree on, how could we so be naive how could we be so naive to assume that when we talk about decarbonization, our transport system, our food system, our democracy, our economy, we just talk about emissions. We don't. We talk about um, a culture that has been established in many parts of the world, especially in the global north, that connects all that is beautiful, all that is fast, all that gives us culture and strength and prosperity, like cars, like houses, like planes, like a certain style of fossil fuel productivity, a certain style of exploitation, all of that has been neatly connected to the idea of wealth, of freedom, of prosperity. So when I now go out and say, hey, can we talk about the climate? We can go one further. You know, we suddenly end up here in, um, in, in, in wonderful places like the Barbie movie that wouldn't work without the liberation through a car. And here again, we see the very interesting and very neat intersection behind emancipation, liberation, but also fueled by something that you could call fossil fuel productivity. Can go um, further. We see that uh, when we look at our democracies, this is a picture from a recent protest in Germany that we organized. It's one of the largest, or it's the largest coal mining um, area in the whole of Europe, which makes it the largest source of emissions of Europe. So it's right in Germany, right? It's a lignite coal mine. And that lignite coal mine company behind it, RWE, has in the past been responsible for destructing dozens of villages in Germany. And those villages try to defend themselves, but the law in Germany, which was designed over the expansion of coal mines, has been neatly designed around protecting fossil fuel companies more than they protect people and villages and livelihoods. Again, you know, you see, by the way, the windmills in the in the in the back, uh, they have been taken down now, so that the wind, uh, the coal mine, could be expanded. Um, we're now kind of fighting against it more and more, but. What I'm saying is, when we talk of climate, we speak of culture, we speak of wealth, we speak of a very certain understanding of liberation and emancipation, but we also speak of a certain system or a certain way that our legal system is set up, which is protecting one thing over the other, which again was in places like the US, but in particular also in Germany, set up to protect ongoing fossil fuel exploitation, making it as easy as possible for fossil fuel companies to kind of go out and destruct as much as they can. And we make some fast pick one. Yeah, and we are um, bringing in an example from, from the recent US um, presidential debate. You might have seen that, right? So in the, what you could call the most, um, <laughs> important presidential debate that happened in a long time just before one of the most important elections happening um, in years. Um, the most existential crisis of all time was given airtime of in total two minutes in which both candidates made their point about not wanting to ban fracking in Pennsylvania. So I'm not from Pennsylvania and I can't even vote in this country. It does strike me though that no one in this entire debate mentioned that A, presidential candidate can't really ban fracking in a state, you know, they can ban fracking on federal land, but that is, so the question itself is a bit odd. One could have also mentioned that there's actually five times as many jobs in Pennsylvania in renewables than there are in fossil fuels. One could have mentioned that the vast majority of Pennsylvanians do not own a small fracking business. Or one could have made the point maybe that if you really love Pennsylvania, if you're really standing up the, for the economy and the people and the land of Pennsylvania, you might stand up against those very companies destructing that very land and provide an alternative plan to grow, say, a stable economy in Pennsylvania that protects jobs, that protects people, and in terms of fracking, also people from out like incredible and un, un, uh, unimaginable health incidents. When we speak, yet that wasn't possible at that very point, or that the candidates didn't feel that way, because by the time when we speak of fossil fuel staring to criticize a fossil fuel status quo, would in that moment mean 
criticizing or questioning a very certain idea of what is wealth, what is stability, what is good for the people. And so here again, we do not just talk about the climate, we just don't just talk about the weather, we talk about a culture behind a fossil fuel economy that seemingly provides stability, that seemingly provides prosperity, that seemingly pro provides futures, which obviously again has now gotten a new very interesting twist, seeing that parts, vast parts of North Carolina are currently underwater, again making this very obvious point that if you really stand up for the people, you might want to stand up against fossil fuel destruction. And um, that is interestingly enough, um, not a new, that's not a new um, tendency to go here would be the German um, German kind of counterexample from what is now more than 30 years ago, um, where we saw the very same rhetoric trying to protect one thing over the other, protecting industry over people. And this was probably the first step leading into what was later known as the largest consumer fraud um, kind of incident in decades, the diesel scandal, fueled by this completely irrational trust in the automobile industry over the protection of the people against emissions. Yes, if we go um, one further. And that again leads, of course, to all these, um, all these odd uh, phenomenons that we see today. I'm not making the case for any kind of activism. I'm an activist myself and I have the deepest sympathy for people who criticize certain actions and yet it is staggering that in the world that is, you know, either flooded in drought or destructed by hurricanes, the, the aggression in terms of climate is less and less directed against fossil fuel lobbies, fossil fuel economies, fossil fuel companies, fossil fuel politics, and is more and more targeted against climate activists who just last week, for instance, got a two year jail for throwing some soup. Um, which is not just, you know, posing big questions again about a legal system. So who is protecting the legal question and what for and whom against, but it's also you know, giving a great case against about the irrationality behind that certain kind of fossil fuel addiction. Because when we look into, in terms of Berlin, if we go one further, we see here um, all traffic jams. That's again from my latest book. You see all traffic jams. Each little circle is one traffic jam. In Berlin in 2023, it's been more than 18,000. And you would see that it's the yellow ones caused by climate protesters. Every other traffic jam is caused by cars. Because we do find out the majority of traffic jams are actually caused by cars. So please, as politicians, you know, they should get angry about traffic jams, but maybe, you know, um, fight, uh, find um, other villains here. Yes, so much. And I think we will wrap it up. That is usually the work that I do. Um, and we see, yeah, and maybe to wrap it up, the climate emergency is real. When we talk about the climate, we don't talk about the climate. We talk about everything else. We talk about culture. We talk about freedom. We talk about a good and a stable economy and what protects us and what doesn't protect us. And I find it, yeah, it is obviously... Um, weird and confusing and yet I find it I think liberating to think about all the irrationalities in our climate discourse from a lens of fossil fuel addiction um, and all we can do about it. Yes, so much. Thank you, that's fine. So very much. Uh, our second or his surrogate, um, or and his surrogate are well known to us at Rutgers. Professor Gubadi Badolu is a world-renowned political economist and activist. As an anti-corruption expert, fossil fuel critic, and environmental defender who's taught and conducted research on public finance management, transparency in, attract, in extractive industries, and good governance. Before becoming the current senior visiting fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences in the 2021-2023 academic years, Professor Ibadolu was an affiliated visiting professor here at Rutgers in political science and in economics, and for several years uh, a research fellow at the Rutgers Center for European Studies. 
His research focuses on oil and gas revenue management's economic, social, environmental, and political implications, the Azerbaijani elite's corruption and embezzlement in Karabakh, and the EU's gas deals with Azerbaijan that support the Azerbaijani regime. He served as a board member of the Extractive Industries Transparencies Initiative and staunchly advocated for transparency in extractive industries, even in the face of very high government pressure. Um, and he's also investigated the assets of the Azerbaijani elite and offshore companies abroad, playing a crucial role in what became the Pandora Papers, uncovering these properties, exposing corruption facts, and conducting anti-corruption advocacy through YouTube channels. His establishment of the Azerbaijani Youth Education Foundation in the UK is a testament to his commitment to educating and developing young Azerbaijanis. For these efforts, he's been by this government from prison, from, uh, with a prison sentence um, and a brutal detention under inhumane conditions for 274 days after, he was with, after which he was transferred from prison to house arrest. Currently, he's facing the prospect of, of up to 17 years in prison for his work. Therefore, while he is present virtually uh, online, it is actually his son, Amin Bayramli, and one of three of Gubad's extraordinary children, only Guba, although Gubad only just graduated himself last May from Rutgers, um, who will be presenting his father's work. And I could actually say a lot more about um, what Amin himself has done as a youth activist. Um, Truly really extraordinary, but I'm going to let him get on with the presentation now. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much, Belinda, um, and thank you so much for coming. And I want to thank Belinda because of so much work that she has done on my case, on my father's case. I am a former Rutgers student. I graduated actually this year. I, you know, a year ago, I was sitting actually in these seats. I took an econ class here. I'm a graduate of statistics and economics. And uh, today I want to talk about Azerbaijan and uh, my dad's case. Uh, Azerbaijan this year is holding COP29, which is, well, the slideshow is opening. I will just wait for it quickly, uh, which is the biggest uh, climate conference that you could, you know, you could hold. And this year it will be in Azerbaijan. A year before it was in UAE and a year before it was in Egypt. As you may see, there's a lot of authoritarian countries holding these important conferences. Uh, we could go one slide up. And, you know, today we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the three things. Uh, one of them is that my dad is a climate activist. Uh, I am just talking on the behalf of him here because he was prisoned for 10 months and now is in a house arrest for four. It's because he spoke out against the Azerbaijani government for their reckless spending, but also their reckless use of oil. Uh, if we could go one more slide. Uh, this is Azerbaijan. It's a very small country. It's ranked horribly 164 out of 180th. Uh, one of the things that Azerbaijan is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Ranked zero points out of 60 on uh, political rights and seven out of 40 on civil rights. We are ranked below Russia and we are ranked on the same level as Belarus. And you cannot exist the, you cannot exit the country by train or by car. You could only exit the country by plane and it's strictly controlled by the Azerbaijani authorities, making the country pretty much closed borders, like Turkmenistan and North Korea. But we'll go to the next slide. This is the, this is the important bloodline of, blood of Azerbaijan. Even though Azerbaijan has only 0.4% of the global reserves, it deploys 5% of the European oil. And that's one of the things that keeps Azerbaijan going, is European money, oil money per se. Uh, Azerbaijan is not rich on oil or gas, but it made it so by supplying it to Europe, and the Europe has been looking away. Uh, those are the pipelines that are going through, uh, and some of them go through the, uh, all the way to Greece, and some of them go to um, Turkey, and some of them pass through Russia. And these pipelines have been the bloodline of Azerbaijan, making them 18 billion euros. Uh, we could go one slide. Uh, this is the some stats about Azerbaijan. Uh, it made lots of money from oil. 90% uh, of the experts are from British Petroleum, and that's from oil. 
And now we are holding the most important climate conference in Azerbaijan, where people like my father are in prison because they spoke out against it. Uh, you know, my father stood in Rutgers and taught the kids of, you know, Rutgers, uh, taught Rutgers students. Previously, he was at Duke. He taught at uh, Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton, and before that, he was at UNC Chapel Hill. So he has, you know, huge uh, experience on t teaching in the United States, but now he's in prison because he spoke against the government. We could go one more slide, and this comes to the Europe. This comes to the Azerbaijan and EU Energy Corporation, and that's one of the things that Azerbaijan is able to destroy the civil society is because they're able to sell their oil to Europe on a cheap price. I'm assuming those deals are really backlogged, and you don't you don't get to know about that. But Azerbaijan does supply a, a hefty amount to Italy and some more countries in Europe, and they're building more more pipelines to do to Central Europe. Which, you know, one of the things that I, I'm at the Hill a lot and I talk a lot. I, talk, I meet with senators, I meet with Congress people. And one of the things that once you build a pipeline, which we have right now, it's really hard to get away from Azerbaijan and you're dependent on because, because of the infrastructure. And then Azerbaijan could set the conditions. And that's something that is, that we are seeing happen right now. One of the things is that Azerbaijan holding the cup, the president of Azerbaijan said the oil is a God-given gift to them. I'm assuming that God hates my country or something. Because oil is not a gift, it's a curse. But also, uh, also, also at the same time, we are expanding our offshore oil, oil fields. And that's one of the things is that when you're holding a cup, you probably wouldn't want to do that. Uh, we'll go one more slide if we can. This is COP28, which was, which was in UAE. You know, not an oil country. They get to control the, uh, you know, they get to control the discourse, and you know, that's the things that they said for uh, call on the government decisions that are made. And this year, it will be. We could go to the next slide. It will be in Azerbaijan. Uh, we could go to the next slide. And this is a police officer kicking a police officer who's trying to kick a, you know, civil right activist. Um, we're ranked horribly, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, you know, I have gotten calls from my father where he had terrible voice. I mean, he's in a terrible situation. One of the things is that he has a hard time walking, you know, he has a hard time seeing, and he, he has no access to medication. And that's what Azerbaijan does. A uh, bit about it that our United States government, if you go to Twitter and search up the US embassy in Baku, tweets about how great the relationship is. They tweet about it to the oil companies because they need it. Uh, one of the things that cheap is, the oil is so cheap, and many of, the, many, many of the students do like a cheap oil to, you know, it's below three bucks. And I understand that, but it's also something that my family has to pay the price for it. Where we go to the, um, where I had a conversation with a senator who said they had a conversation with the president, which president said they will keep the norm like this in order until the election, where in order to keep the oil prices low. Uh, oil prices matter a lot, and the countries that who produce oil are the mostly authoritarian countries. So you can't really trust them in terms of you know controlling the fossil fuel production, but also helping the environment because the civil society in many of those countries are in prison meaning that only control that they have is pro-government uh, civil society that are paid by them, uh, which one of the things is that World Bank have put out that Azerbaijan is not on the track of following through their, with their promises. And this is the same issue with many countries. I mean, one of the things is that as long as, as us Europeans or Americans give out these, uh, you know, help these countries that who produce oil get away with such a horrific human rights crimes, you know, there will be no accountability. Uh, one of the things that we're facing right now is horrible human rights. Uh, phasing out fossil fuel production, which the, which the president said he will not. Uh, participation of civil society, forget about it. More, uh, 319 plus people are in prison and most of the civil society is in prison. The ones that are left are scared to even leave the country because they, they usually arrest people in prison. Uh, they usually arrest people in the airports when they try to leave, and so they will just stay quiet while the COP29 happens. Again, this is the biggest climate conference that we could ask for, and we'll have folks from the climate activists that are running around and asking for more to be done. But the question is, a lot of, you know, we have a lot of debates between the climate, there's a debate that we have is that it's between should we involve human rights in a climate topic? I think absolutely yes. It's because when you look at it, the, mo most of the oil produced by the countries that are had horrible human rights problems. And if we don't involve that, how will, how will we have checks and balances? And that's a major problem. We could go to the next slide. Um, 
this is Azerbaijan. You know, it's a pretty country in some ways, and in some ways, it's not. Um, I want to show that white dome. I don't know if you guys see the single uh, tall building, and there's a white around sphere. I don't know if you all seen it. Uh, if you could all see it, it's 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 a sphere. On, it's a sphere, white sphere, and that's where the COP29 will be held. That's where the openings of the climate conference will be happening and the closings. Nobody that is coming from around 80,000 participants from foreign countries will see what's on the background. That is a kilometer away from the place. That is near the capital, also almost inside of the capital. And this is, you know, it's horrible what's happening because I know because I pass by it all the time. When I lived in Azerbaijan, we used to pass by them and they smelled horrible. And there's people living right near it. And, you know, most of the government pro civil societies will say they should have not built a place there. Well, they should have not been permitted to build a place there. But also, as average Azerbaijani makes only $4,000 a year. And, you know, you can't really say move out and go build somewhere else when they've been living there for hundreds, you know, 100 or more years. And now Azerbaijani government suddenly got money and they're building all of these. And one of the things that they're responsible for cleaning this, but they're not cleaning it. They're not cleaning any of this. Uh, we could go to the Next slide. Uh, so one of the things is that Azerbaijan, British Petroleum, has launched more productions within the six, million, six billion dollars worth. All of these are done by my dad, who's sick in a house for us right now. He served 10 months in prison, where they kept him in horrible, horrible conditions. And one of the things that one of the contributors of that is British Petroleum and many of the you know, US or European uh, oil producers, they back Azerbaijani president, they back Azerbaijani government. Uh, we were able to you know, push enough that the British Petroleum made out a statement about, on the behalf, on about my dad case, saying that we are sorry about the, about the news about him being in a really critical ill conditions. And that's, that was only it. And then after that, the CEO of BP traveled to Azerbaijan as the, as the business as usual. Uh, one time my dad told the British ambassador to Azerbaijan, let's cut the act. You, you can't go to a country and sign a deal in 45 minutes and, and come out. They want this to happen. They want the countries like to exist so they could just do easy deals with them. And that's the problem. If we're talking about a climate, we also have to talk about the countries that exist like Azerbaijan and many more that if you look through the Middle East, you could see easily. If you look through Africa, you could see easily these oil producing company, uh, companies. I have heard about Nigeria, where Shell is responsible for $20 billion in damages, environmental damages, and they're only offering 700 million. When not accepted, they actually pulled out and made five ghost companies in the country and put the blame on them. And you can't track that. And that's a, one of the big problems is that when we have cheap gas in the United States, which many of us enjoy because we are students or we are new graduates or anyone in the country, it's cheap and we want that happening. Somebody else is paying the price. At this point, my family is paying the price. Other 319 people in Azerbaijan are paying the price, including their families. All while the British Petroleum and more companies are expanding their, um, their offshore uh, oil things and so on in the country, which is also happening in pretty much all over the Middle East. And, and you know, my whole thing, the whole presence that I have is that it's very important to have the civil society, have the human rights included when we talk about climate. Because when we talk about climate, most of the oil producing countries are the, you know, major problem, problematic ones. And, you know, we have to include them and we have to keep them accountable for what they're doing. And, you know, uh, one of the former Azerbaijan ambassadors to European Union who defected and changed sides and spoke against, against the Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani government said that I've been in the rooms where the European officials come in. I've been in the rooms where they come in to talk to the president. What they do is they talk to the president and then the president leaves and then they talk to the aides about, oh, sorry, maybe could you guys address some of these cases that we've been hearing about, like some of these people that have been arrested? And that's all it is. And they can't solve that, will not solve a problem. At the same time, we know all the Russian houses in, in London and so on. All, we, know, we know all about the wharf and the wealth that the, the Russian oligarchs hold all over the Europe, which is the same case with Azerbaijan, same case with Kazakhstan, and same case with many other countries. You know, but one of the things that this oil, you know, also the problematic oil has touched former Rutgers student. I used to be a Rutgers student, but it's it's that close. It could be somebody in Rutgers that is having a problematic because of the you know the oil production country, 
And, you know, that's, I, 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 in my opinion, that's highly problematic. And, you know, if I have to call for action, it would be, there's a video of it, there's a, I don't think video will play if you want to go to the next one. Uh, but, you know, you might not play. I didn't consider the time when I'm putting the video, so we might not be able to watch it. I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. But okay, it's 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 quite all right. So what I would say is that uh, when it comes to the call for action, if anybody asks me how can we help, uh, we all have the right to call our senators. We all, we all have the right to call our congressperson. That's the biggest power we have as Americans. Most of you. And you could call your senator and you could call your congressman and say, I have a problem with this. I have a problem with Azerbaijan holding the cup. I have a problem with Azerbaijan doing a climate conference that is remotely not supposed to be because, you know, they don't meet any of the requirements. That's something that we could do as a, you know, one thing I'll call is that if you call your client, if you call your senator or your congressman, do mention about my dad's case. That's something that we highly need help. That's something that I would advise a person to do so. And again, thank you so much. We can, uh, we can start taking questions, and you don't have to do that unless you want to. Um, we can take... Let's take questions from the audience for any of the panelists. Mm -hmm. So, um, any, any questions, and we can actually pass around the, um, mm -hmm. the mic. Any questions first in the room, since um, the majority of people in the room are, are undergraduates? Yeah. So just to recap kind of like what you were just saying, are you saying that you don't like to use the word climate in the case that you're arguing with like a climate denier, for example, like a climate change deny, like it's not useful or productive. And then instead you would, you can argue to not use fossil fuels anymore. Essentially, that's very broad, but. Uh, well, I think that the fossil fuel industry and the right kind of gained climate politics. Uh, and it came out in exactly what Kamala said in the debate, the second uh, minute. There was one minute on fracking, and then there was one minute explicitly on climate. And she said, look, she said, I'm not denying climate change like Trump over here. I believe all the science of climate change, and it is really serious. We have got a massive climate problem. And that's why I'm so proud that Biden and myself, we have jacked up renewables very, very high. And we've managed to do that while at the same time doing this other thing I'm very proud of, which is producing more oil and gas, creating more jobs than ever before in the United States. And so this shows you that people, that, that climate change and renewables, or let's say tackling, the word is always tackling now, tackling climate change and promoting renewables and promoting fossil fuels all can go together in as part of the Democratic Party's political strategy, right? And how do you bust through that? I would say bust through that by forgetting about tackling climate change and not really pushing very hard for renewables because capital is pushing for them anyway and pushing for the retirement of fossil fuels, which is really only the, the one thing that we need to do for the environment at a large planetary scale. Um, so yeah, climate has become and people don't even say climate change anymore. They just say climate. And they don't say climate emergency uh, in, in polite circles at, at all. So I th and, 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 that t and, and it takes it, the word climate takes attention away from the driver, the primary driver, which is fossil fuels. And you think about it, when we've had industrial policies of regulation, like against CFCs, uh, against mercury, um, uh, PCBs, we name the policy by the pollutant, right? It's not like PCBs are a, or let's say, are a marsh policy or a bog policy, a wetland policy to protect PCBs. We say we have an anti-PCB, anti-pollution policy. So let's name the pollutant when we talk about the conditions for life on planet Earth, I would say. Um, we 
Yeah, uh, we have a question from Hadiya Khan um, on the Zoom. We, we also, by the way, have many people on our YouTube stream um, via which unfortunately we're not able to take questions. But Hadiya, please go ahead. If you still have a question and you want to unmute yourself. Is it not? Is it not set up so she? Okay. While we're trying to get uh, to make sure Hadia can ask her question. Would, would you yeah, can I ask, a, because it's so interesting for me, I mentioned it in the beginning, um, I've been trying to figure out how people make their decisions about this this vote and what matters. And you, um, I found it very interesting to see um, the ambiguity, the ambivalence in the room on the one side, kind of obviously right, quite clear awareness of the entire, like of the planetary emergency. And on the other side, it seemed quite a, like, D d different um, kind of voter emotion in the room. Could I ask, like, and I really just, um, this is really just uh, out of curiosity, when we talk about these things and you mentioned that climate has become of a useless term, and I would definitely agree, but because climate for the ones is close to Marxism, you know, uh, for the others it's a survival strategy, um, and for others it just doesn't exist as a concept, so what do we even talk about? Um, which, by the way, is also very interesting because coming from a European lens, this is not a right versus left election. That's not how we would frame it, right? There is an anti-democrat and a moderate right-wing um, candidate in a, on a European scale. This wouldn't be left and right, and I don't think the Marxist would let Kamala play with them. But that's a different, <laughs> but that's a different story. But we also see how easy it is to shift something from one end rather to the other end. So you think it's an even playing field, and this is not what we're having. There's someone who wants to in my understanding, at least protect the constitution, and the other one is open, openly fighting that very constitution which organizes the election in the first place. Um, so this is, yeah. But I, um, but it's interesting to me, um, d d d because that's something that we are not, that is very new to me as a concept, is like the denial of science doesn't really exist in the German public arena. We have some irrationalities about science and obviously their delay strategies but do we, you, you maybe there are some people who consider um, voting for Trump or you have relatives or friends or someone what does it do to any voter opinion when maybe some of the most basic ideas of political discourse which would mean the acceptance of facts is up to debate like is it does it even matter is it still a thing or have you is this like you know, have people just accept this? What does it do? Because I would, yeah, it's something that is very new in my, uh, yeah, in my, uh, yeah. Uh, I give you the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do not identify as someone who uh, would vote for Trump or who would uh, align myself with things that I don't know as facts related to science closest person to myself who I know who does that would be my grandfather um, and my understanding of how he got to that point was he sits at home with Fox News on 24 7 and uh, he talks to his friends and no one else and his friends are old white men um, in Florida who um, have also heard things from Fox News and uh, pseudoscience from Wikipedia or from other news sources. And I have asked them in the past, my grandfather and his friends, what sources they use. And they, they don't talk about their sources because they either don't remember or they're embarrassed of them. Um, and he has just stopped paying attention to where he's getting his information from. And that was quite a while ago that he stopped paying attention to that. And he started paying attention to anything that encourages him to be afraid of, of other groups of, of women, of queer people, of trans people, of cl the climate or fossil fuels or anything like that. Um, and 
if it goes along with this narrative he has, he likes it. And if he, it doesn't go along with the narrative, it's not true. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. And we have two mics now, so I'm going to, uh, so we don't have to run back and forth. Um, yeah, Ilya. Questions for any of the, or comments for any, right, yeah. That, it's coming to you. I guess to build off what she's saying. Um, yeah, just oh, sorry. I guess to uh, based off what she was saying too. My uh, my girlfriend's father is the same way. Where um, during COVID, his job just went to like bare minimum only. So he just sat in his room all day watching YouTube videos, and that's all his sources. And he doesn't believe in climate change, even though my girlfriend's marine biology major and has spewed everything imaginable that is like factually based by science. He just does not care. Um, he just like he's like locked into what he believes in. And he doesn't really care. If, like, if it doesn't align, he'll just brush it off. Or he'll harp on like, the same point over and over again, like how climate change is a cycle. It doesn't exist. That's his main point, really. So it's just, they're just stuck in their ways, really. Oh, speaking of this, OK. Hello. Um, I hope we, I'm not drifting too much from um, a, a thread of thought, if there is one going on right now. But I ha my question, I have a question, uh, since um, I'm here as part of a um, uh, class on European, uh, the idea of European, uh, Europe versus, say, the rest of the world or America, I would like to know if you think there is enough um, coordination uh, or the uh, you know, same kind of uh, mentality between um, America and Europe in the thinking of uh, where we're headed uh, in terms of a crisis in, in, glo in um, climate change and a uh, solution, an, an idea of what direction we should be taking toward um, dealing with this problem. So if there is enough of a consensus of feeling between uh, America and Europe and the rest of the world uh, concerning this problem. Um, I'll answer that question in terms of like civil society participation goes in, you know, environmental policies. Uh, they do work together. Uh, they generally work together to lower the gas prices. As, as you know, right now, the war is going on in Ukraine. It makes a difficult situation, which makes them rely on, you know, making little Russia's what we call is countries like in smaller caliber of Russia, government policy, everything, you know, not caring about their citizens, but also not care, caring about the environment and expanding their gas routes. You know, they're building more pipelines through, uh, you know, Europe. And that's one of the things is that I, you know, I have, I think I've been in the State Department so many times that I could say what their policies are. And they usually look at the European in terms of European countries or Middle Eastern countries that, that does environmental damage. But also they look at the Europeans and they want to ensure the safety of European economy, in turn the safety of oil and the energy prices being down so they could go for the winter. Meaning that they do work closely together, but that closeness might not be the best, you know, best participation given the fact that this allows, you know, some of the countries that are, you know, small energy producers to be become a big headache later on because that's will be what will be happening. Given the fact that Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, all of these countries are using this opportunity to start start building pipelines or building small pipelines to connect to the other ones so they so they could you know supply gas, which makes them reliant on. I mean, I think one of the big issues we face is that these oil producing countries need to you know, start being accountable for what they're doing in terms of environmental damage goes like fuming, right? British, uh, the British Petroleum Exxon Mobil has ways to stop that, but they're still letting those fumes go out. Let's, they're still letting those CO2s go out and they could capture that, but they're not. And, you know, it's for the Americans and for the Europeans, 
it's for their interest to just to keep it like that low investment high profit and low gas prices you know what what they're getting in return and i think that's something that is profitable and you know i i talked on the human rights aspect i really didn't answer that question in the climate way so i'll let somebody else answer that one what i found quite remarkable comparing um europe and the us in terms of uh, what I heard from you was also like an environmental sentiment. This kind of touches up on Elena's work, which I found incredibly interesting, by the way, the uh, anthropogenic view on on the infrastructure. I, I um, as a geographer, I'm really curious about material politics, so the power of materials and uh, why it is that nowadays an, like a rare species of a plant can be more powerful than a metal pipeline because of different protection rights. And Elena made this point about the... You know, the, the regional identity in a in a place. So how is it that people on one spot would fight against fossil fuels and the others would fight against renewables and how much it has to do with the 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 the, the, the very sentiment of who are we, what is our identity. So what is interesting in Europe when you look at it from a climate energy perspective, we see that technically we're very connected. So Azerbaijan is um for instance providing lots of the lots of the oil for Europe. We see there is a gas grid that is basically connecting vast parts of Western Europe uh, with a fossil fuel gas, but we also have the networks that allow us to kind of very easily trade um, renewables, which I would say this whole energy networking system across the European continent is, in my understanding, one of the greatest achievements technically leading towards cheap renewables because it allows us to bring like wind energy from, from Norway down to other places and the solar from Spain up to wherever. So technically, I think there's a, it's quite utopian to think that after so many wars where Ford still are, but you know, we see basically all parts of the world involved in, you know, resource fights. There is also energy collaboration that is happening and that is actually quite futuristic. So what we see though, is that because we are such a small continent compared to the US and our countries are so much smaller, it's quite easy to invisibilize the costs attached. So you were speaking about your Azerbaijani family and your father who bears the cost for the human rights violation connected to the oil. I'm thinking about the um, the LNG fracking happening here down in Texas, causing incredible environmental detriment, uh, 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 turmoil and, and pollution and cancer, which is eventually, you know, shipped to Europe. In Europe, our environmental standards are way too high. You couldn't do that kind of fracking that is happening in Texas, but we can import that very gas. Is there a huge hypocrisy? Of course there is. And yet, national borders, national attention, national economies, national visibility make it quite easy to invisibilize the external costs attached. What strikes me, and, and it's also obviously much easier to justify a status quo for the well-being of the greater country. You know, we need it for the country and, you know, we, we need the, the cheap oil. What is What I find fascinating and I, you know, didn't know about this so much, I've been speaking to so many activists on frontline communities in the US, how here there's a there's a even though the country is bigger the proximity i would say between those benefiting from fossil fuel deploitation and environmental and climate degradation on the one side and those who are suffering from it is much higher because it's the same nationality because it's the same you know there's the same us identity making it possible that one person is in Flint is suffering from an environmental injustice caused by basically an industry down the road or a government on the other road or voters, you know, in the same in the same state. And that I think, I don't know how people emotionally deal with that because we're so used to invisibilizing and externalizing all these things. But that I think is a huge difference when it comes to US and uh, EU climate and energy questions. Um, other questions in the room or there's a question over there Uh, yeah, I was wondering, we've been like discussing, we've been like kind of being educated this whole time. I just want to know like what are some practical things we as like individuals could do to help fight like climate change and make change because, you know, I grew up, um, there were like all these ads on TV all the time talking about how like it was like up to us to recycle, it was up to us to that. And now we, now there has been a change and we're starting to look at like corporations and systemic 
um, issues that are like the bulk of you know climate change and environmental problems but i just want to know if there's anything like we could do as individual americans excellent question are you doing anything already no i'm not not no shame or anything just curiosity um i mean no i'm gonna say no and have you googled it no so here's my observation i do think it's a bit interesting and i'm just taking you as an example here but i say it with love and respect and everything it is interesting that and i i've obviously observed it with myself too we have the ability to in a minute book a very complicated um, holiday somewhere in Panama and figure out the cheapest Airbnb offer and the local specialities, this interesting cinema we want to go to. We know which friends to call up that we once met on this trip in Italy. And we do also get checked on which medical procedures we know. And maybe we get an extra travel insurance. We know all these things because we have this great innovation of our smartphones and the internet and we know so much. And it, I'm just observing, and I see this in any place where I go, in the US, in Europe, why it is that, that very ability to help ourselves, to just check up, isn't, is so absent when it comes to the climate. I find it, I find it, I don't, I'm just observing, I find it very, very interesting. How is it that we are so good in helping ourselves in so many ways? When we get into a car crash, we immediately know how to do it. When our family members calling us saying, hey, I need your help now, we would go down the road. But if, if there's something what you could arguably call the biggest disaster of humanity is, you know, um, around us, we do not th we do not apply the same mechanism that we've trained and one reason you mentioned it one reason is certainly that that has to do with this kind of propaganda on the recycling thing but i do also think that there must be something else to it which we should investigate further but then you said and i maybe there is a mentality shift and just to say that i'm going to go to the practical ones as well people have said or industries fossil fuel industries have been really keen on making sure that the only thing you worry about is you've recycled or not and we know that's a bit stupid and they say oh it's not about individual action and that is where i would disagree it is about individual action because eventually what is structure what is systemic change it is just an accumulation of individuals changing together so the idea that it, that we are not asked as an individual that is not right either we are needed as an individual but we just need to once consider who are we as an individual are we a consumer yes are we shopping sometimes yes but mostly we are students we are workers, we are friends, we have networks. We know today that some of the biggest impacts on people's opinions come not, are not necessarily coming from TV or YouTube, they're coming from their nearest environment, from their friends and family. We have a huge influence, influence on the people around us. We are also all voters. We also all have a voice and when it comes to the institutions that we work in. And it's interesting as well that, you know, we would spend eight hours, most of us eight hours, um, five days a week working somewhere and not consider that to maybe be the most info, impactful place where we could do it and expect to solve the greatest crisis of all times in that one half an hour that we have a spare time on a Friday afternoon. So I would say there's a lots of confusion about the individual and the climate. But to your question, which is a really good question and the one that desperately needed in this room, one first thing I would uh, do is, uh, are you a student? Yeah. Okay, so first thing I would do is, is there climate initiatives you can join in Rutgers? I know that is very new to me. There's a American idea that you have to be an executive director and founder of something in order to matter. You're great as you are. You don't need to be that. You don't have to start something new. The most sustainable thing you can do right now with a bit of a time pressure in climate is to join something that already exists. Join an organization at your uni, join an organization at where you live, join an organization in your hometown, join a movement. And that is the beauty of the whole everything in terms of climate justice. 80% of the work is showing up. It is really getting up and going somewhere, showing up to this meeting, showing up to this dialogue, showing up to this whatever conference, whatever it is. That's the first thing. So I would consider your thing. Then obviously we are a few weeks out of the election if you can get down to Pennsylvania and good go door knocking because um, this is my personal opinion here, but this is not a disaster for this country only to get a science denier in the White House. It's a disaster for the entire world. My personal opinion. If you can do anything, 
to prevent that. I think that's a, on short term thinking the best thing. There's postcard writing, there's phone banking, there is um, door knocking, there is um, video conferences, there is donation cake sales. Like the, the, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this, but this is not usual in many other parts of the world that there's so many ways you can get involved in an election, that there's so many offers that is outstanding. And it's, it's you know, a, a beauty of this democracy that you actually can get do more than just, just your one vote. And finally, as students, I would say arguably one of our biggest powers is thinking of where we're going to work. What career are we going to build? We will not fix the climate injustices in the world in our free time if millions of people are spending every day to wreck the planet. This is just not going to work out. So we need to consider our careers. Where can we go? And there are amazing careers that can be built out of climate questions. And we see that the business world is rough, like is drastically changing because more and more people are coming in. Young people are coming in and saying, I'm not going to work for a company that doesn't have environmental standards, that isn't committed to climate justice, that isn't introducing more and more climate perspectives into their things. And, you know, not everything is black and white in climate, but sometimes it is. And we can actually distinct quite well which companies are standing on which side of the story here. So think about these things. And then um, because the climate injustices in the world are making us very lonely, we need to have fun. We need to talk to friends about it. We need to make sure that we find joy in what we do. So whatever you do, um, check on yourself if it's bringing you joy, because we need you in the long term. Off you go. Uh, let's see, then you could come right after me. Um, I think you could be forgiven for finding it difficult um, to locate activism on the internet because the internet is organized to funnel you towards buying stuff. I know this because as an egotistical author, I Google my own books and I find 100 websites where I can buy them. And at the bottom of that, I find some commentary from somebody who's read one of them. Um, so it's not organized to help you. And um, yeah, I mean, Louisa is right. Getting involved locally is the way to start. Um, Food and Water Watch, uh, do you live in New Jersey? Yes, I do. So Food and Water Watch is the lead organization of a bunch of coalitions that are working to stop fossil fuel expansion. And I'm a part of that, our union is a part of that. We stopped uh, the Meadowlands gas, gas plant that was proposed a few years ago. Another one that New Jersey Transit wanted to build. We stopped the uh, liquefied natural gas trains and an export terminal in South Jersey. We're working on stopping the Passaic Valley Sewerage Commission from building a gas plant. And these are all plants, incidentally, green-lighted or not red-lighted by the Murphy administration. Um, so, which, and the Murphy administration has a plan to convert the entire grid to electric, I mean, to, uh, to uh, uh, renewables, but, but I don't think they're going to meet that target. Um, so, so yes, get involved in activism in, up to and including unlawful civil disobedience because it works. And this is why the fossil fuel industry is not expanding right now north of, um, uh, let's say, well, from New Jersey north and east, the fossil fuel industry is just stopped in its tracks and there's no infrastructure being built because people have blocked it with their bodies or with petitions or with, uh, uh, you know, bird dogging and demonstrating. Um, I'm going to say something a little bit at odds, I think, with what Louisa said about voting. Um, both of our political parties are very pro-fossil fuels. And actually, Biden has allowed for more fossil fuel production, including on federal lands, than Trump did. I mean, Trump is probably going to top Biden if he's elected. But they're kind of competing with each other. And this is why believing in climate science really doesn't matter anymore, because it's entirely possible for people in their muddled brains to believe in the science, but defer action for another decade. And I think our state has actually been, our, our federal government, has been captured, it happened beginning in 2000, has been captured by fossil fuel interests. And because of various ways our constitution frustrates democracy with the Senate, the Electoral College and so on, I don't think we're ever gonna get legislation in this, comp in this country that shuts down fossil fuels at the federal level. So if you got us, I'm motivating you. You live in New Jersey, we're not, po vote, well, what election, uh, you know, you can vote for Sue Altman if you live in, in NJ District, uh, the Congressional District 7. 
I'm more than voting. I'm saying if if you got a split, if you have a weekend or a career where you're going to be canvassing for politicians or you're going to be going out and blocking construction sites for pipelines and that's how you allocate your time, the second thing is much more valuable and effective. Um so one thing I'll say is that my sister lives in Sweden and my, my brother also lives in Sweden. What is different from Europeans that we have is that we could call our congressman, we could go on center and say I'm pissed off about something and they take a note of it. And depending on how many people call them, they actually take a serious note of it. You could call them and say I want to schedule and come meet with a staffer. You could do that. One thing that is very different from what we enjoy in the United States is when my dad got arrested, I didn't, have, I didn't know anyone. I, I, I didn't know any congressman and senator. I just went in and called them, emailed them. You could find their email. You could call them and say, I want to come talk. And they let you do. It doesn't matter if you're from their district. I mean, they still let you do if you have a problem that is cross-district or matters about the state. And you could check the positions where they are, like uh, some of our congressmen. Uh, I, I'm sh I, should, I should know his name. The congressman, I think, from District 7, Republican, he's the head of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee of Europe. So it makes a lot of difference about, it makes a lot of, uh, you know, decisions about Europe. Um, Ken, what's his name? Oh, uh, yeah. The Republican. No, 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 Republican one. Uh, we have Chris Smith, who's the head of the Human Rights Caucus at House Foreign Affairs. You know, they, this is all makes a big difference. You could just call them and you could just make them aware that you're concerned about something. I think that's the most powerful way of pushing for anything because they really, really take your cases seriously. Uh, you could call your senator. We Democrats control the senator. Our, our senator is Democrat and both of them are, in, you know, working. They're working hard and, you know, you could call them anytime. I just wanted to talk about the um, recycling. ExxonMobil was uh, pushing for ideology that the recycling actually helps the environment and it's the biggest helper. So the state of California is suing ExxonMobil. Now this happened six days ago because they were just spewing lies out there that the only thing you have to do is recycle, which is not true. But you know, one thing you could do is just Google the name of the Senator Brooker's office, call them and it takes three, four minutes. You get hold of one of the staffers and say, I'm pissed off. What if it's stuff about, I'm stuff about climate, stuff about human rights. Do something about it and they'll take a note of it. That's very simple. Um, I'm going to let uh, Elena close us out, but I just want to make one remark. Um, Amin really knows what he's talking about here. Um, it was Amin's work actually with the American Congress um, as well as in Europe and, and around the world that, um, that got his father released from uh, from the truly inhumane prison conditions he was in and at least left to house arrest. So, I mean, there is an example for you, it, another example, in addition to the ones we've mentioned, it, it does work. You can make change. Elena, please close us out. Thank you, Belinda. Yeah. Uh, no, just to add uh, an observation to the Luisa's uh, point that we need joy. I really agree and I really loved your observation. I think that we also need hope because one point is that the struggle for justice in climate change needs a collective horizon of hope and of shared time, of shared temporality. Uh, the, this obsession I observed in Sardinia for uh, identity, and uh, you can observe the same in uh, many places in Europe and in the, in the US, comes from uh, the lack of a uh, uh, sense uh, of efficacy, 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 self-efficacy, yes, yeah. okay, yeah. of individuals and of communities into society. And the great narratives of the 20th century had, had many wrongs, but perhaps the virtue of allowing society to have a shared idea of the future, and we must uh, reappropriate this capacity, this ability to have a shared idea of the future, and perhaps to act, uh, to improve active, uh, material activism relationship is one of the best ways uh, to make hope uh, real. 
Thank you so much, Elena. Um, and thank you also for staying up till midnight, um, along with many, uh, many of those who are joining via the YouTube live stream, as well as um, Gubadi Badolu, uh, for whom it's what, 2 a.m.? Uh, <laughs> or 3 a.m. Um, and 2 a.m. Yeah. Um, so thank you to everyone who came here, to everyone online. Thank you especially to our speakers and those who are here. Please join us upstairs in uh, outside of room 6051 on the sixth floor for a reception. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank <laughs> you.